Greetings, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, our, our guest tonight is responsible for me uh, reading Elmer Kelton. Uh, he's also responsible for me uh, reading Ed McBain. And while I was at it, Steve, Stephen Crane and George Orwell and um, uh, Tom Wolfe and a lot of other people. And the reason is that until 10 or 15 years ago, I had a long period where I read nothing but nonfiction books. And I'd be lying there reading something of great substantive importance, and my wife is breathlessly inhaling some book two feet away, and she kept thrusting it on me, you've got to read, you've got to read, you've got to read this guy, Coben. And finally, one day I did. And then I read everything else he'd ever written. <laughs> and ever since that time, I now am always reading fiction along with the nonfiction. So I owe him my reintroduction to fiction. And I'll bet there are people in the room who have been just as captivated as I have. Uh, he is, bar none, no question, America's most uh, successful, I don't know if beloved's the term, but certainly uh, closely followed uh, fiction writer, and certainly mystery writer. He's won every award there are, one named after Edgar Allan Poe, and others um, uh, named after uh, uh, Seamus, whoever that was, and every other award available. But more to the point, uh, his last six books all debuted at number one on the New York Times list. It's been, each has been a million seller. He's one of the most inventive, creative, and uh, uh, constantly delightful uh, writers uh, uh, on the American scene today. I'm sure there are many, many fans in this room who will join me in welcoming uh, uh, our friend Harlan Coben. Well, we learned one thing quickly. Your wife's the smart one in the family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, that's right. <laughs> Not the only one who can say that. That's right. Well, we'll get to that later. So we, uh, 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 the format will be, uh, as has often been the case, uh, I'll ask the first few questions, which is to allow you time to uh, think through your own and summon your own courage. And we have microphones, I think. They'll be available. So uh, uh, starting in just a, a couple minutes, I hope the, the bolder the, uh, among you will, will uh, come forward and line up, and we'll, we'll get to your questions as soon as we can. But just to get us started, uh, uh, let me ask what America really wants to know most, and that is, uh, uh, tell us about your basketball career and how, how you gave up a, <laughs> uh, a sure ticket to NBA stardom to be a writer. Well, you know, I, I often say, uh, when I created Myron Bolotar, he, he was with Wish Fulfillment, where he's, uh, he's smarter, he's funnier, he's faster. Um, I do have been to areas. I'm a better dancer, I'll demonstrate later. <laughs> and I'm slightly wiser in the ways of women. We're not talking about two uh -huh. geniuses here. You know, we're talking about, it's like saying syphilis is better than gonorrhea. We're just talking about two guys. <laughs> but uh, uh, he's a better basketball player than you. But I, but I do, I don't want to brag, but I, I was an all-American uh, basketball player. What I leave off of that sentence is I wasn't picked all-American um, by Sports Illustrated or something like that. I, but I was picked all-American by the the Indianapolis Jewish Post and Opinion. Um, yeah. I am a Jewish All-American basketball player. Somehow through uh, painstaking research, the crack squad at the Indianapolis Jewish Post and Opinion found five Jews who played college basketball that year. And I think it was me, Heshi, Moish, and two guys from Yeshiva. Uh, and that's my basketball career. Well, uh, so the literary world's gain was, was the sports world's loss. <laughs> Was there ever a, a struggling artist period for you, uh, Harlan? Was there ever a time when it wasn't clear that you were going to have this kind of success? And if there was, we're, we're, what was plan B? Uh, well, yeah, that, I, mean, I think it's one of the things that, that, that um, in today's market, people sort of expect to hit bestseller them right away. Mm -hmm. My first New York Times bestseller was Tell No One, which was my 10th book. Uh -huh. um, my first, my... My first book, uh, I got like zero, very little money, and I, I wrote a series of books called Myron, by Myron Bolotar, and my first Myron Bolotar book was a paperback original, and I got an advance of $5,000 for it. And I don't want to brag, I hate to brag, but three books later, the fourth Myron Bolotar book, 
I was up to 6,000. <laughs> Overnight. <laughs> so, you know, I, and I get these emails from people who now are trying to either self-publish or do it on Amazon, or like, you know, I've, I've written three books, I have a Twitter account, how come I'm not selling like you and John Grisham? You know, it doesn't. Uh, so, uh, I love those years, though. I mean, I've, I have a great appreciation for those right. years. And, like, you know, anything else, anybody who's had success in anything, if, if you don't really work for it, it doesn't feel quite as good, does it? You weren't doing anything else on the side? You know, oh, J- Jiffy Lube or I had, I had, a, I had a real job for, for, um, for uh, eight years. I worked in the travel industry where I set up trips overseas, um, not because I'm a brilliant linguist, but because my grandfather owned the travel agency. Um, <laughs> but what I actually learned from working was that I'm not really good at it. I mean, there's uh, there's three things that make a writer, I say. Two are obvious. The third is really with key. It's not so obvious. The the first is inspiration. You have to be inspired to do it. Well, duh, let's move that aside. The second is perspiration to write. If you want to be a writer, you have to do the actual work. And that means writing, okay? Creating characters is not writing. Outlining is not writing. Doing research is not writing. Hanging with your friends at Starbucks is not writing. None of that is writing. Only writing is writing. Only the moments you sit your butt in the chair and produce words counts as writing. Everything else is flotsam and jetsam. But the third, I think, and most important thing that you need to be a writer is desperation. Mm-hmm. And that is, I'm not fit to do anything else. <laughs> okay. Like hold the real job. I was on a panel with a, a bunch of uh, crime writers, and we were, they, were, they asked us, as they do, uh, what would you be if you weren't a writer? And one of my friends said, a US senator. I'm like, oh, please. <laughs> I'd be a duvet cover. This is it. <laughs> this is all I got, you know? So, I, so I'm disorganized, I'm forgetful. You know, I mean, look how I dress today. It's nothing, nothing works for me. So this is all I can do. So I told Harlan uh, in advance that I, I, sh- I knew there must be a lot of questions that he was absolutely uh, weary of answering and I would be happy to omit those. He said, no, go with anything. So here yeah, they come. Go ahead, man. So I think people would like to hear about what is your MO? How, how do you work at this? I mean, what's, what's, what's the routine? And, and a question I, I, as part of that, of these unbelievably uh, tangled and inventive plots, do you map them all out to the end before you start, or as occasionally I'll read somebody who claims that they sort of let the uh, plot take them along? Which are you? Well, uh, on that note, uh, well, there's a, there's a, that's a big question, so let me try to. The first part is the idea. I'd say it takes nine months to write a book, it's like childbirth. The best part's the idea. <laughs> 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 that guy didn't get it. Can someone explain it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me start with how I, how I come up with ideas. And it's not a pretty process, but I'm going to really try to let you inside the brain. Normally, it's from something in my real life, and I constantly ask, what if? So a few years ago, for example, I wrote a book called Promise Me. And the way that came to me is I overheard a couple of teenagers who I knew and loved. They were talking about drinking and driving. I overheard them. So I pulled them aside, maybe some of you have some, done something similar, and I said, promise me you won't do that. Here's my cell phone, I don't care if it's three in the morning, I don't care what you're doing, or I'll drive you, I won't ask any questions, won't tell your parents, just promise me you won't get in a car with someone who's been drinking and driving. Now in real life, that's it, nothing else ever happened. But fiction writing's asking, what if? Well, what if a teenage girl calls my hero at 3 a.m., she's in New York City, he goes, he picks her up, he drops her off at what he thinks is a friend's house, the next day she's gone, no one knows where she is, what if? So those are the ways, that's one example of how I kind of come up with some kind of story. One time I was going to, um, the photo, in the days when we used to go to like Motophoto or Photoshops to pick up your photos, and I'm picking up this roll of film, and as I'm going through it, for a second, just a split second, I thought there was a picture in there I didn't take. Turns out the picture was just upside down, but go with me on this. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, what if there was a picture in this role I didn't take? What if that picture uh-huh. changed my life? Uh-huh. And I start asking, what if, what if, and I, go, and I go through it like that until I start having the remnants uh-huh. of an idea. Um, the problem with this is it sounds, it sounds like it takes about 15 minutes to come with it. This is three months of work, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is three months of sitting on the couch going, no, honey, I can't throw out the garbage. <laughs> I'm working. Can't you see I'm working here? Hardest part of my job, convincing my wife I have one. Um, <laughs> so that's the first part, the, the, um, the idea. Then I know the beginning when I start, and I know the end. And I, I compare it to driving from my hometown in New Jersey to LA. I may go Route 80, chances are I'll go via the Suez Canal and stop in Tokyo, <laughs> uh, but I pretty much uh, end up in LA. One of my favorite quotes on writing comes from E.L. Doctorow, 
who said that writing is like driving at night in the fog with just your headlights on. You can only see a little bit ahead of you, but you can make the whole journey that way. So I know a couple of spots maybe along the way. I can see a couple, but the rest of it, in my case, just happens. But if you ask writers their opinion, if you ask 10 writers how he does it, you get 11 different answers. So every writer does it differently. Some books, I don't do it this way, but that's mostly my MO on that stuff. Somebody said, I've quoted it many times, writing's not hard. I just sit down and write what occurs to me. It's the occurring that's hard. <laughs> and, you know, whether it's a speech or some piece I'm trying right. to write, it's always like that. Once you get that far, I guess that... Well, it's uh, the, first, the first word's the hardest word. Uh, I mean, it's the blank page is, is intimidating. That's why I don't normally write at home, because I'll use any excuse not to write. So if I'm home, I'm like, yeah, I'll write, but first, uh, uh, let's put aluminum siding on the house. <laughs> you know, anything. Where do you to, go? Right, to avoid that moment. I go anywhere. Uh, uh -huh. Some people have a ritual where they have to write in a certain spot. Uh -huh. My ritual is to write any place. Yeah. I mean, I've written in Starbucks's, I've written in coffee shops. I almost wrote today in the chocolate bar, um, the Harry's Chocolate. <laughs> I went there for chocolate, no one told me, all right? Leave me alone. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm gonna have a quick little, quick little piece of chocolate. He wrote me at three and that's the claim he made. I just had a sweet tooth I didn't know. <laughs> Uh, but then he wrote me back at 5.30, was still there, so I think... <laughs> I was looking for chocolate, it was hard to find. <laughs> I kept thinking the bottom of one of those glasses will have chocolate. Um, <laughs> but this, the key to writing is to just write, so um, I'll use up a place like riding a horse, I'll, I'll use that place until it stops working and the horse dies, and then I'll find another horse and ride it. Mm. Um, and whatever's making me write, I will do. Yeah. Uh, somebody, it might have been you, put a, put a label on your presentation uh, rules of writing and which ones, to, how to break them. Uh, so yeah. give, us, give us one rule or something people think is a rule that, that you don't buy and would, would break. Well, uh, first write what you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, I write about murder and mayhem and kinky sex. Well, kinky sex. Right, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know about any of it. I mean, I, I, really, a writer has to use his imagination. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm also not a believer. You'll often hear, do a lot of research when you write. I'm one of the few writers, if you're out there and you're interested in writing, I recommend you don't do research for two reasons. Um, one, research is more fun than writing. So it's like, oh, I'm gonna place this scene on Park Avenue in New York, ah, but I gotta fly to New York, I gotta look, I gotta see the girls walking, <laughs> I gotta smell the hot dogs. No, no, you have an imagination. You've been there maybe before, use it. Right? And then you can go back later and do the research. The second reason is, have you ever read um, one of those books where the guy does a ton of research and so he slows down the plot with a lot of cute factoids that he learned? Not a problem with me, because I don't know anything. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a couple, of the rules, really whatever, and again, like I say, some people, well, you have to sit at one desk and write instead of certain hours, no. For me, it's, it's whatever will make me write. It doesn't matter how tired I am, how, how strong out feeling I am. Uh, you know, some days are happy, some days are sad, but when I see the books now, wow, there's a lot of books. Yeah. Um, it's my 27th book in, in 27 years. So I started when I was six. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Now, uh, I never have, and I know I never will, come close to figuring out you know, where L.A. is, where, 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 the, where your books are going. Thanks. But I live with somebody who Thanks. claims that she's figured out some of them. No. Which I, yeah, okay. Well, that, so I don't think so either. But, but here's my, but my question is, uh, if, if by chance yeah. somebody did, is that a defeat or is that uh, you just feel did good for them? Did they buy the next book? Yeah. Did they have a good time? I read reading it. That's it. Yeah. Um, Normally what I find is someone will say to me, oh, I guessed that ending. I go, oh, you guessed this part? Oh, well, not that part. Oh, yeah. You know, I got that part. Oh, so I like to have four or five twists at the end. So this is something for everybody um, a little bit. You know, I, I fool most people most of the time, but you can't fool everybody all the time. But I, I, if you, you have to enjoy the whole journey. Yeah. I, I want you to enjoy from page one to the end. I write, um, Elmore Leonard had my favorite quote on writing which is, and think about this when you're writing, his, his advice on writing, which if you learn nothing else today, like you're learning something, um, <laughs> but Elmore Leonard said, think about this, I try to cut out all the parts you'd normally skip, which is genius, mm. just sheer genius. Mm. And I do that, I want on every page, every paragraph, every sentence, every word I ask, is this compelling, is this gripping, is mm -hmm. this moving the story forward? Am I genuinely moving you? Because it's one thing to stir the pulse with a fast moving plot, but if I don't stir your heart, and I stir your mind, you're not coming back for another, and I'm not having fun writing it, so. Yeah, well, you don't have to worry about me ever figuring it out. I don't even try. <laughs> I don't want to know. I, I love when I want to be surprised. Yeah. And, uh, and some people enjoy figuring, yeah. you know, thinking they figured it out. Now, <laughs> um, 
so this, the, my, I could be in a, in a uh, dead end here, but uh, let me just venture an hypothesis. I, one thing, when I look over the, I haven't read all 27, but a lot of them. Um, but to me, there's a couple patterns. Uh, bad guys lose. They get what they deserve. There aren't these dark black endings that, you know. Um, uh, there's an affection for small towns, suburbs, you know, the kind that a lot of literary figures love to dump on. And your characters love their families. Sometimes it gets them into trouble or tragedy or something, but, you know, parents really love their children and, parent and children. Imagine this, love their parents. And um, are you like a Midwesterner uh, in disguise? <laughs> I mean, uh, am I misreading you or is this? Well, first uh, of all, don't read the new book then. I don't want to okay. crush your spirits. <laughs> Every time, I, every time I'm accused of being something, I almost yeah. intentionally write something that's the opposite. Yeah. So the, this new book has a pretty dark ending, and I really piss all over suburbia. But um, normally, <laughs> nor, normally you're right. When, when, I, when I actually first created Myron Bolotar, to not get too corny on you, but I gave Myron, Myron and I were fairly similar, as I mentioned, but I gave him something I always wanted, and, I get, and he, get, he has something I always want, and I have something he always wants. Myron's dream in life is to get married, move to the burbs and have kids, so I can't give them that. On the other hand, my parents died fairly young, and Myron has this wonderful, warm, loving relationship with his parents that I have a tendency to overwrite and get sentimental on. Tough, cut him if you don't like him, it's cheaper than therapy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but part of that was also, I had not seen that really done in fiction. It's always like, you know, the father was abusive and the mother put out her cigarettes on the guy, you know. So I thought it would be interesting to sort of represent more what I know, which is a loving relationship. And, also, when you're trying to write about what people want, if I were to ask everybody here, would you kill somebody? The answer was no. We're, well, maybe not this guy. <laughs> but if I asked you, would you, kill someone to, would you kill someone who's trying to kill your kid or to save your child's life? Now the answer is yes. So where is that line? There's one. There's one. Where in the middle, if I bring it closer and closer on both sides, that's where I want to be. We all get that emotion. It's a universal emotion. And... It's easy to be cynical, but it's more fun to be realistic. So just to remind, I'd uh, like to see somebody advancing on the mics here soon, because I'm sure there are better questions in the, uh, uh, in the audience than I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have. So I'll, I'll just do one or two more while you, while you uh, get your courage up. <laughs> um, 27, I guess you said? Yep. Uh, get easier as you go or harder? Is the, which, is, which, is, which took longer, the first one or the next one? I, I think probably about the same, but maybe a little harder. Mm -hmm. um, I keep waiting to figure out how to do it so it'll be easier. I keep thinking it's going to be easier. It's always, well, and, and insecurity is a great part of what, we, <laughs> what I do. So I'll be writing the book and I'll go, oh my God, I lost it. I was so good before. <laughs> what happened to me? When did I lose it? And five minutes later, this is sheer genius. <laughs> Someone's going to read that ad book that's already out there, not give this work of Shakespearean proportions. <laughs> and that goes on all the time. And also, I, I, I think one of the things I kind of conclude a little bit like, if you can imagine a giant grass field, okay? So the first time you're writing your book, you're slashing through the field to try to get to the other side, but you have no idea how long it is. You have no idea where you're going. You're getting a misdirection, but you can just keep slashing. And you finally reach the end. Now you go back to the start. You have to do it again, but you can't hit where you've already slashed. So you start again. You've learned a little bit, so maybe it's faster that way, but you can't go and place the way you went before. Now you come back again. And it just keeps going, which is why, as a writer also, you need new experiences in your life to get more grass growing. Mm -hmm. Wow, I really reached for that analogy. I'm not sure it works. <laughs> but that's, that's what I'm going with today. So three different people asked me, do you, want, do, we, do you want me to plant any questions in the audience? I said, no, it won't be necessary. The, Here's all right, a the, uh, you know, an audience full of, of literary-minded, uh, well-educated people like this, it can't be a shortfall, and happily, I guess there we go. Once we unload. Yeah. It went wild. Well, uh, Mr. Coben, I'm a huge fan. Thank you. And I read all your books, and I just read your latest book. Thank you. And it, yes, it is a departure on the family side, but that's Thanks. okay. But I noticed that um, you quoted some academic research. Yep. And is that 
No, are you usually are you reading academic journals for your research, or how did that come about? It was probably stumbled across but in a Twitter feed. No, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it was a fascinating, the, the, the article you're probably talking about was by Toby, uh, Toby uh, Moskowitz, who's a professor at the University of Chicago. He did a fascinating study, which should be interest to anybody who's a sports fan, but he studied why home field advantage is an advantage. And it's not the reasons we think. It's not because you're more comfortable enough to travel. It's not that you're familiar with um, the place. It's not even that the crowd is on your side, except in some way. What he found out is that you get more calls when you're at home. Not because the ref's trying to fix it, but because of social conformity. When people are applauding or booing you, you subconsciously want to please that, that, those people. So the referees do favor the home team. This is all over the world, every country in the world, every sport in the world. I just found that kind of cool. So it, since my, my, my book involved a little bit of how crazy parents are with their kids in sports, I thought that would be kind of an interesting thing to throw in. Well, to follow up, I didn't know if you knew that Toby is a Purdue graduate. Oh, he's a Purdue graduate. There we and, go. And his father is a professor emeritus as well. So is lives, he really? And lives, still lives here in town. So That's fantastic. I thought that was cool. So. No, I got a nice email from him. I didn't tell him I was doing it. I, I don't, I've never met him, but he sent me a nice email. I guess he heard from a lot. He goes, more people read my study in your book than when I, <laughs> when I did it. <laughs> so that was very nice of him to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Scobin. Thank you for coming to Purdue. Thank you. Um, People that have grown up in New Jersey and people that haven't grown up in New Jersey don't like New Jersey. And you're from New Jersey. But at the same time, there's a lot of culture that affects this country that comes out of New Jersey. So how has your environment growing up in that state affected your writing? Well, it's no question we're all product of wherever we kind of grew up. New Jersey, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that my, my books are now in 43 languages around the world. And I don't say that to brag, but to kind of make a point. Uh, and my first movie of one of my books was a French movie. Yet my books are really New Jersey. And what I learned with the creative process, and with most, most things you do in life, is the more specific you are, the more universal the appeal. If I try to think, oh, you know, I have readers in Bulgaria, let me see if I can make this town more appeal to them. It never works. There's something very universal in what is specific. This goes for a lot of, I have a friend who has a clothing line uh, called Lily Pulitzer, which is these loud pink and greens. It looks like somebody threw up pink and green on a tie. <laughs> uh, and, I was like, and it's like, that's the weirdest thing. And he goes, when we try to be more universal and less, in my words, ugly, um, <laughs> it didn't work. And so what I've learned about, and I think the New Jersey thing is just fascinating for people. I mean, we are Sinatra, we are, Springsteen, we are, um, you know, the Sopranos and all of those sort of things. It may be something with geography where really we're not a state, despite what people think. Half of us is the suburbs of New York, half of us is the suburbs of Philadelphia, but we're the poor cousins of both, so we have a little bit of attitude. I don't know what it is, but there's no question that New Jersey is a huge part of who I am and, and what I've become. And I love New Jersey, stop that. Everyone loves New Jersey. <laughs> Jeez, I've been places in Indiana. You, you gotta love New Jersey, come on. <laughs> Let's be honest, you drive out to certain areas, you're, just, you're a lot happier in New Jersey. I'll, I'll I think the motto you, of certain cities is, um, people make fun of New Jersey, with a big question mark, right? I'll, I'll cut you some slack if you can explain how it became, to call itself the Garden State. Garden that I, that State. I never did get, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the one thing about New Jersey is, like, um, I, I live in this old Victorian from 1865, it looks like the Adams family house, <laughs> brightly painted. The whole town is all gardens, things like that we stick all of our garbage on the New Jersey Turnpike and Garden State Parkway where everybody drives. So it looks like, the bad, like a bad scene from the Terminator movie when you drive on those roads, but you get off, it's not so bad. We'll take your word for it. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, Sabrina, hello. Hi. Welcome. Hi, and I'm from Delaware, so I'm not sure I agree with you on the loving New Jersey part. <laughs> but I do have a question. Earlier, you were talking a little bit about um, one of the characters in your novels, and I was wondering if you could just explain, it sounded like you had a pretty kind of personal relationship with that character. And I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit more how you view your characters while you're writing, after you're writing, if you're ever like, wow, that was a weird character that just happened there, or something like that. <laughs> well, there is, there, first of all, I hate saying anything that sounds foo-foo or mad. I hate like when writers talk, Oh, I don't write the books. God comes down and my fingers start moving <laughs> across. And, and, and the characters decide where the story's going. I, you know, I, I, so most of me realizes I just make this stuff up. Like, 
I have a character, Myron Bolotar, has been in my 10 of my novels, and sometimes I'll get a call, you know, well, what's Myron doing now? I'm like, I don't get a call from him on Friday night. It's just <laughs> you know, I, just, I just made him up. But that's, that's, that's the, that's the, the norm. But the other side of the coin is, these people do, in a sense, come to life. Like, I start usually, again, there's different ways. I know some writers who will actually write, like, 50-page bios, single-spaced on their characters. I start more with a core, and I kind of learn about them as I write. And I try to develop character not so much by telling you, you know, in 1865 this happened to them or whatever, but by how they react. And so I, everything that happens to it, I sort of say, how is this person reacting? And a few pages in, that person's reacting just naturally without thought. The most important thing I think about a character is not necessarily being nice or likable, but real. And I do say, it's not, and this is not necessarily likable, is would you want to go to Harry's and have a beer with that person, right? That doesn't mean they're nice or likable. That could be boring as all outdoors. But would you want to spend an evening sitting there talking to that person and listening to what their life is about? And sometimes that could be a really an evil person, frankly. And that's, that's sort of the gauge I try to do when I'm creating a character. I want, every, I want even the smallest character to have a reason for what they're doing. For those who just read The Stranger, even the worst bad guy, you have to understand their motives. Otherwise, I don't like monsters. I have no interest in psychos. I have no interest in serial killers. Every person has to have a reason. And a reason where you can almost say, I can almost see myself doing that. Thanks. Thank in that you. gray zone you were talking about in between. Is more, is, you know, it's like, it's like a, a foul line at a, at, a, at, a football, at a baseball field, right? Mm -hmm. It's made of lime. Fair and foul are very, very close to one another. And if you can mess that up a little bit, trample on it, now fair becomes foul and foul becomes yeah, fair. That's, that's where you want to play. That's where you want to play. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I love the Boulevard series, and I've Thank you. read almost all of them. But I, I end up feeling kind of guilty and wonder about myself because my favorite character is Wynn. <laughs> and and Thank you. it's sort of like, like liking Francis Underwood on House of Cards or Walter White, but there, it, it, he's, he's close to a psychopath, yeah, and, he's, no, he's, and, but I really in, enjoy the parts about Wynn more than everything. What, what, what's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> If you're reading my books, you need no help, sir. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, he's so much fun to create. Uh, I'm actually doing a TV show right now in England called uh, The Five, and I have a character who's a little bit like this, and the network keeps saying, oh my God, he can't do that. I'm like, yes, he can. The more he's, the more sometimes violent or things he'll do bad, this is my job as a writer, I want you to love the guy who's doing bad, and that's a real challenge and, real, and really fun. And there's a part of us that loves that, that's the thing. Win has easy answers in life. For Win, it's all black and white. You cross a certain line, you're dead to him. And there's something that uh, inside of all of us that has a, a certain, that, you know, that, that, that appeals to us. I based Win, I just want to say, I based Win, I don't normally base people on, on, on friends or character. All of my friends always think the good guys are based on. Uh, you know, <laughs> that loser with halitosis, that was me, right? No, they never think that. It's always, that guy gets all the chicks, that's me, right? But um, I based Wynn on my college roommate who has a name equally obnoxious to Windsor Hornlock with the third. Very good looking blonde, old world, family came over in the Mayflower asking for a tea time, kind of a <laughs> jutted jaw. And he used to, before we'd go out, we were in college to fraternity parties, he would actually, he would look in the mirror and go, it must suck to be ugly. <laughs> you can't make that stuff up. So I took him and I, I made him a little psychopath. But thank you very much. It's kind of you to say. I think you once told me he was all that, but he couldn't fight his way out of a, out out of a good, laundry good bag. bag. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> In real life, he can't. That's right. <laughs> so you're uh, writing in an absolutely massive genre with uh, mystery and thriller. Uh, and I would kind of like to write in science fiction and fantasy. So I'd like to ask you, if someone, as someone who has become successful, when you're writing in a genre that has that much competition, how do you cut through the noise? Oh. Um, the, I really don't know the market. I, I'm not good with the word genre. I, I kind of always, I look at it more like a haiku or a sonata, where within that, it's a form. What I've loved about crime fiction or thrillers or, or mysteries, whatever you want, is it compels you to tell a story. I'm not just gazing at my navel I'm writing something that you know, is compelling and moving. And if you think about it, if I asked you to name anybody here to name their top three or four favorite books that are 100 years old, there'll be a crime in every one of them. I mean, none of them will be just a guy walking <laughs> through life. It's going to be a crime or war, which is crime in a sense, if they're old enough, Dostoevsky and that kind of thing. Um, 
I don't, wouldn't worry so much about the competition except to read it. What you just have to do is, is write the damn best book you can. I really wish there was another answer. It's, I, people always look for, I get questions about like, well, how, many, how do you get more people on your Twitter or your Facebook or your social media? In my view, those are completely irrelevant. Um, the biggest breakout book of the last five years has been by my friend Gillian Flynn Gone Girl. So I tell people, see how she did it. Look at her social media campaign. Look at her, 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 her Facebook page or Twitter page. She doesn't have one. Doesn't even have a Twitter page. Doesn't even have one. Um, so rather than worry about the competition or whatever else, just write the, the dang best book you can. If people want to read it, it also doesn't matter if it's going to be an e-book or stone tablets. They're <laughs> going to read it. You know, people ask me about the e-book revolution. Every time they start Amazon, I'm, I'm like a little kid, like, la, 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 I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I'm just going to put my head down and write the best book I can because I know if I write the best book I can, I've put myself in the best position to succeed. I've done the most I can do. I'm not smart enough to know if Amazon's right or Hachette's right. I'm only smart enough to write. So my advice to you, if, if that's the word, is don't worry about what else is out there. Just write something so great that we're going to find it. Hope you do. I hope you do, too. OK. Uh, we've all heard the stories about rejections, and <laughs> as a fellow writer, Are you talking I'm, about my high school dating life now, or <laughs> as a fellow, we weren't going to do personal <laughs> stuff, Mitch. <laughs> yes, as a fellow writer, I lived that life as well. Yeah. So we would all, I'm sure, many of us would be curious if you're willing to share before you kind yeah. of broke in. How many, how many rejections have well, you kept track? Well, I, I was lucky that I got published right away, but by a very, very small house. I was 26. Um, so I've been published for a while, but you face rejection as a writer all the time. I still get reviews. I still get, you know, uh, all sorts of weird kind of rejection sort of thing. Not the publishing ones anymore, uh, but movie ones, or this is going to happen, that's going to happen. You know, uh, it's why, you, by the way, in today's world, do not read your Amazon reviews or anything else. You'll just lose your mind completely. Um, you know, I, I always would just assume it was somebody I was mean to in high school. Uh, <laughs> even though I was always nice in high school, but somebody was mean. But um, it, it, you know, it took me a while. My case, though, was literally, like I said, I, I mentioned Myron Bolotar making $5,000 a book. What I didn't say is I wrote two books before that, Play Dead and Miracle Cure. And I've actually mentally blocked, but I think it was $1,502,000 for those um, as advances. So I, I try to appreciate each step that I have. But yeah, I mean, I, I, when I tried to move up from that level, which was two books, and then I realized I couldn't stay in that particular ghetto. I had to move to a, a bigger ghetto, so to speak. It took, I, I had five years of rejections. Here's the thing about rejections also that's hard to, t to, to take, is that whatever reason they give you for rejecting you is baloney. All really you should read every rejection as, it just didn't quite work for us. You know, they'll make up some, oh, you know, we're not, we're not doing medical thrillers now. Oh, we're not doing one-armed jugglers right now. You know, that's nonsense. It's never, it's never that. In market, I pay no attention to the market. I hate that too. It's like, oh, well, you know, the Gone Girl kind of books are in right now, or Da Vinci Code books are in now. I'll write that. First of all, you won't write it well. It's going to be a year before you finish it, so that trend will be over. And it doesn't make a difference. The example I often use is, I don't know if you guys know Alexander McCall Smith, who wrote the uh, number one ladies detective club, which is a huge, massive group of bestsellers. Trust me, no publisher was saying, you know what books I'm looking for? Fat African women solving crimes in Rhodesia. I mean, no, <laughs> no one was asking, or Botswana. No one was asking for that in publishing, no one. Or, or when Walter Mosley broke out, no one was saying, yeah, we want a black detective in Watts in 1948. No one was saying that, they were just good. Wow, that was a long answer to a really simple question. So, so it is like high school dating. They never give you the right reason, right? <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. I got toughened up by high school dating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was used to rejection. I got it. Publishing seemed easy after <laughs> high school dating. All right, well, um, I'm a student novelist also, and that was actually going to be my question, but I'll expand on it further, I guess. How did yeah. you go about finding an agent? Did you have any difficulties in that process? And how do you think that has changed just over the course of your career, that publishing process? Unfortunately, I don't really know what it's like to get an agent now. Um, so I can't, I can't really re answer. The market's changing so rapidly, and there's self-publishing, and there's uh, different kind of things now, and some people don't have agents at all. You know, for me, it's like, you know, you're asking me a basketball question, I'm talking about peach baskets, you know what I mean? So I don't really know 
the best way of doing that anymore. I'm not the, I'm not the right person to ask. But all I can say is if you don't have a completely done novel, not a great idea, not a great 100 pages, not a great 150 pages, not almost done, oh, my first draft's done, completed, done, done, solidly finished, ready to go and get rejected by everybody in the world because you're very young. You're going to get rejected. You send it out to agents. Start writing the next one while it's out because trust me, the book's not as good as you think it is. You're just too young. And then next or second or third. I mean, my first published book when I was 26 was already my third book I had written. The best way to learning how to write is to write. Um, so I would not worry so much. I, I, again, I don't know the markets either, but I found that people who pay more, too much attention to the markets, let's put it this way. All the successful writers I know, and I know them all, I know Stephen King, I know John Grisham, I know Dan Brown. We went to, in fact, Dan Brown and I went to college together. We were fraternity buddies. I'm not even the biggest selling author in my own fraternity. I've sold, 60, <laughs> I've sold 65 million books. I'm not the biggest, by, I'm not even close to the biggest in my own fraternity, my own college fraternity. But I don't know, none of them were worried about marketing or agents or whatever else. All they worried about was telling the, the darn best story they could tell, the darn best book and the rest of that somehow falls into place. I know that's not the answer you want to hear, but that's the, that's the real answer. All right, so as a writer, and you've got the 27 books out there, are you able to focus on just one at a time, or is it a process? I know I've written three books at the same time, and then you've got the marketing all at the same time. Right. How do you balance, I guess, having a family, um, writing different books, the marketing for one book, while you're writing another one, while you're editing a third, how do you find the balance in all of that? Uh, well, first, and again, every writer is different, so I don't knock that. I can only write one book at a time. I'm like a boxer in the rink, in it ring, and by the end, the 15th round, I can barely lift my arms. I get, I'm almost getting knocked out. I finished the book. I have nothing left. I can't even, I can't move for like three. Literally, when I finish a book, I write 40 pages, usually the last day. I can't move for like a week. I have, I've grown a playoff, <laughs> NHL playoff beard. You know, my kids have thrown bananas in my room and ran away, you know. <laughs> there's just not, there's nothing left. I can, I can only do one at a time and market one at a time. The, the, the real answer, the way I like to think of it is, it's my job. So it's like asking anybody in this room, well, how do you, you know, how do you fix pipes when you have a family at home? How do you, this is my job. I have to do my job. I can't be above my job. So yeah, of course I have family at home. I have other obligations. Just as everyone in this room has a job and they have to do it, they have to do it and still control their family and balance the rest of their life. So even if it's an artistic process or not that, we can decide if it's art or not, but you have to treat it like a job. And every great writer I know, or writer produces treats you like a job. There's a great quote that says, amateurs wait for inspiration to arrive. The rest of us just get to work. Mm -hmm. And that was, I actually read that quote, it wasn't by him, but in the Philip Roth book, who's about as literary a writer as you get. You have, so it's the same way a plumber can't one day wake up and say, I can't do pipes today, I'm, I'm a little <laughs> too important. I have to watch. It's the same thing with the writer. So yeah, you just have to figure out the balance. And, and the, here's the thing, if you, and this is the, my, my being tough on you thing, is if you can't find that balance, if you don't have enough time to write, you're not meant to be a writer. Mary Higgins Clark, one of the dearest women I know, at the age of 37, Mary had five young children and her husband died. The next day, her mother-in-law died. Mm. Mary, is, Mary is now 86, so this is over 50 years, we're talking about 50 years ago, okay? She was left with no money. She had to work a full-time job. She used to get the, and get five kids ready and no help back in those days, as you know. So Mary would wake up and write between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. before the kids did. You can always find time to write. Don't tell me you can't find time to write because that's an excuse. And much like, oh, this, this isn't weight gain, it's water retention. <laughs> we have to one day face up. The great 20th century philosopher, Cher, said, <laughs> Cher once said, Excuses won't lift your butt. It's the same thing with writing. I accept no excuses for myself. And that's, that's, I tell this, what I'm telling you now is why I, I kick myself because I feel the same way. Oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. I'm like, toughen up. This is, not only is it a job, it's the greatest job in the world. I mean, uh, I'm not going to fool you. People ask, well, another panel I was on asked, uh, what, uh, what, what's bad about being a best selling author? And I said, nothing. Mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> nothing. What's bad about being a, nothing, it's awesome. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank we you. have an empty mic over here that's calling out for somebody maybe from this hemisphere. So, yes, go ahead, please. How much time is spent rewriting? A lot. 
I don't write like, um, I don't write like this. I write like this. Each day I go back and I reread what I wrote the day before to get a running start. And then every 75 pages, 50, 75 pages, I go back to the beginning and I reread. So by the time my book is done, um, the first chapter has been rewritten at least 10 times. And I write better at the end, but I, I'm a big believer in rewriting. And this is, this is very freeing too. Am I, I, am I allowed to say a, well, mm, let's yeah. say. Um, a great, one of the best books on writing, if you want a really great book, it's also funny on writing, it's by Anne Lamott called Bird by Bird. And she describes it, uh, she has a chapter called The Shitty First Draft. And what it does is it gives you permission, which is so true, to stink your first draft. So the difference sometimes, writer, people are paralyzed. If you're a writer out there who's like kind of afraid to start because it's not, you think, oh, it stinks, it stinks. Remember, I do too, 27 books, still thinks it stinks every day. But the first draft, I look at it like it's like diamond mining. So you take out this big, ugly rock, but that's what's really valuable. And then the rewriting, is, which takes a long time, is what makes it into something shiny and beautiful that you want to wear. But you need to, some people are looking for that beautiful stone in the dirt already that's going to be right on your finger, and that doesn't exist. You got to pull that thing out. Don't worry if it stinks. I got to turn that part of my brain off that says this stinks, not worry about it. Some days, as I said, I write and I'm like, oh my God, this is, every, it's so terrible. Every word is a case of mental constipation that could kill a horse. <laughs> it's just, and then some days, there's like an angelic voice singing in my ear, not often. Mm -hmm. Some days, and when I look at the books now, I can't tell you what I wrote on what pages, because when you rewrite, they all become the same. You can always, you can, one great quote, you can always fix bad pages, you can't fix no pages. I rewrite a tremendous amount. I'm a firm believer. Every writer I know rewrites, except that one guy, but none of us want to hang out with him in the bar. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Good question. Yes, sir. All these questions are great, by the way. I thought you might talk uh, for a moment about the uh, tell no one experience. Uh, the, uh, it has a reputation uh, on its own, of course. and. Uh, I'd like to hear the background. I think you're even briefly in the film for. I am in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I thought in the you movie, might yeah. talk about that for a few. For those moments. who don't know, Tell No One was a uh, a French. It's actually considered a a, and I don't take credit for this. A a classic. Uh, it's on. By the way, if you have Netflix or Amazon Prime, it's on it for free. It does have subtitles. It's a French movie called Tell No One, um, based on my book. Uh, it was nominated for nine Césars, which is their version of the Oscar. Um, it won four of them. I'm in it, uh, I'm in it for about eight seconds, I'm in the background, I don't say anything, but I was brilliant, really. I, <laughs> I, I kind of steal the movie, and uh, I wasn't nominated for uh, a Cesar for Best Supporting Actor. I assume the French still have anti-Semitism issues, it's the only, <laughs> the only explanation for it. Um, but it was a wonderful experience from beginning to end, such a wonderful experience, I just did a, uh, a six-hour TV show, I just finished filming. Um, and I got to have a real part. I got to play Dana Delaney from Desperate Housewives' husband. Um, she demanded I write sex scenes. I said, no, married, leave me alone. But this is why I write fiction, people. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, it was a great experience. Um, uh, the book itself, if I could, this is a, for people who, you no, know, I explained before about how I come up with ideas. And the example I actually often use is tell no one because you know, the ones I gave you were, were really kind of like neat, like, okay, he thinks this happens in his life and he thinks what if, but mostly it's kind of like your, your brain is jumping around. Like, have you ever had one of those nights you can't fall asleep, right? And you're, you're lying in bed and you're, and because you can't fall asleep because you're thinking of something like inane, like, what was the name of the dog on Petticoat Junction? <laughs> There's Bobby Joe and Billy Sue, and, and you start wondering, what, how did I start thinking something so dumb? You try to trace your thoughts back and you're bouncing all over. And it started with how come Burger King doesn't serve Mountain Dew? You know what I mean? Like, all over. So the idea for Tell No One came to me. I was, um, this is what I mean, anything to stimulate an idea. I was watching a really um, bad uh, movie on TV. I won't mention the name of the movie, Message in a Bottle. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> what struck me about this story was it was this, this, this it was a love story that we've seen a million times where the man loses his wife, right? The man's wife dies and he can't go on. And then a hot babe walks by and he's fine. Have you noticed that in these movies, ladies? In that case, it was Robin Wright or it's Minnie Driver or Meg Ryan or somebody, and all of a sudden the guy is perky. So I ask myself in those moments, I get serious, what about the man who can't go on? What about the man who's truly lost his soulmate 
Is there a way I can find redemption? So this part of the idea, it's over here. Before, I was telling you how I lost my parents at a young age. So I have four kids, and, one, and at that time I had three, and I was watching, one day I was thinking about the same way we all do, wouldn't it be great if they were alive? Wouldn't it be great if they could have met their grandkids? And I'm looking at a webcam on my computer, a street cam, and I go, what would I do right now if I saw my parents on this webcam? I took these two ideas and I mashed them together. Man and a woman happily married. The wife is murdered. Eight years pass, he still can't get over her death. He gets an email, he clicks a hyperlink, he sees a webcam, his wife walks by. And little Homer Simpson part of my brain goes, woo, that's that moment. <laughs> So that was, this, and what's really, not to get too heady, but what's really weird is, I, when I thought, I, you know, I, I'm trying to think, I thought of this little idea in my little home in, in Jersey, and I was on the Champs-Élysées with the top actors in France going to the premiere of it. And I don't care who you are, if you're jaded by, by that, man, <laughs> it was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> it really was. Thank you. Yes, sir. I've enjoyed the conversation tonight. This has been very enjoyable. And you've mentioned several times quotes from other authors and things. So as somebody who spends your day putting words on a page, how much time do you also spend reading other people's words? And I guess kind of the, the back and forth, the influence that that maybe plays in your own, in your own work. Uh, good question. Um, I don't know anybody who's a musician, doesn't listen to a lot of music. I don't know anybody who's a writer who didn't read a lot. I read a lot, I read a lot more earlier, though. The problem is now, um, I'd say that if you want to be a writer, you have to read a lot. But every time I read, I'm feeling guilty I'm not writing. Hmm. Um, in fact, my whole life is feeling guilty I'm not writing. This is just something I live with. And if you don't have this, if you're trying to be a writer and you don't have this, you're probably not going to be a writer. But whenever I'm doing anything else, I'm driving the kids in a carpool, there's a little voice in my head that says, you should be home writing. Always. Because, uh, and Mitch and Sherry, we know this well, I have, the only interest in life is writing and, and my family. So a few years ago, because of this, I decided to take up golf. Why I didn't smash this glass and jam it in my eye, I don't know. Would have been preferable, but instead I took up golf. And, but even when I'm out there and it's a beautiful day and I'm hitting the ball, there's still that voice that's always saying, you should be home writing. Usually it's a guy I almost did with my Aaron T shot yeah. on the wrong fairway. <laughs> yeah. But every once in a while it is. Uh, so that just always sort of plays in, in, into my head. So yeah, you have to read, but I read less now than I used to. I, I still love to read. I'll read the back of a cereal box if it's available to me. I'll read menus. I, I have to be reading. Um, one of my favorite quotes, again, this one from Thomas Jefferson. I don't know if you know this story, and many of you probably do. The Library of Congress was founded. It had burnt down, and Jefferson sold all of his books to, to make the Library of Congress exist. Notice he didn't donate them. Mm. Jefferson <laughs> sold them for a lot of money. And, if, and he said, because I'm old, I don't need books anymore. And he started buying books back, and he wrote a letter to John Adams, where he famously said, I cannot live without books, which is the motto of the Library of Congress today. Fun historical facts with Harlan Coben. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Who are you reading in, we won't call it a genre, Right. Who, who are you reading in the, in the general space that you were occupy that, the, 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 that you like? You know, first of all, I read a lot of book people that you don't know because I, I, I get advanced copies. Um, there's a young, uh, and I, won't, I really don't want to name the obvious people like, like Lee Child and, and, and Michael Conley. And the problem with this question is they're all my friends. And I leave someone out and one uh. of you will tweet it and I'll get in <laughs> trouble. Um, but Tana French is a, is a new young writer. Well, she's not that new anymore, but... Uh, a wonderful uh, woman from Ireland who, who really writes uh, interesting books that uh, I like to tell people who, who are looking for somebody new in the crime field to, to try out. She's really good, ton of French. This may be a bit loaded, but uh, to what extent do you attribute your education to your success or your ability as a writer? Uh, education, success? Uh, well, well everything. The one thing we never want to hear is how much luck is involved. So I don't know how much is luck and how much is education, how much is hard work, how much of any of it is. I went to Amherst College in Massachusetts, which is a small liberal arts school, um, wonderful school. And while I was there, for some reason, there was a lot of writers. There's only 400 kids a grade. As I mentioned, Dan Brown was there. Uh, David Foster Wallace lived next door to me um, freshman year. Um, God, we had, we had, I think, five published authors um, in my class, Mark Costello, who wrote The Big If, and Bill Amond as Foxtrot Comics. We had a weird, diverse class. But the one thing that I, I do think Amherst taught me more than just how to write 
and one of the things I, I hope people get from the liberal arts part of their education is the ability to learn how to critically think. And I think that that's really, really important in being a writer. I was always a better math student than I was a, an English student. My math SAT score was 200 points higher than my English, 200, 400. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not quite, I made Amherst College. <laughs> but, but that was more on my basketball. Um, <laughs> But that sort of critical thinking to be able to see and solve problems, I think, helps you in everything in life. Um, and that's one thing our, our, the Amherst College is very good about, was making you read and think critically about things, being able to analyze things. One of my jobs um, as a, you know, we have, a, we have a, of course, a, well, your greatest governor is sitting on the stage with me right here. Um, but as a, someone, as a political person, one of, my, one of the things I'm able to do as a writer is I can actually see all viewpoints pretty well. Doesn't mean I agree with all viewpoints, but I don't, I, I never, I, I don't demonize the other side because it's my job as a writer. Even if I'm writing somebody on something else, I have to make, I have to see their viewpoint. And it's really one of the things that you, can, that you should learn at college also, is to be able to get other people's viewpoints. You don't have to agree with them, but rather than what we do in today's world, not to make a big lecture of this Fox, MSNBC world, but really if we stop that, we could just see the other, the other side of it. We could still disagree, but we could do it civilly. And that's one of the things I also learned in college. Okay, that's it. That was my, that was my serious moment now. Someone ask a funny question, please. Thank you, good question. Comes one. Here we go. In the nick of time, thank you. Okay. Um, so I have to admit, I haven't read um, your books. Stoner! No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my mom, she's a ginormous fan. and She sounds, she, she sounds intelligent. <laughs> she you, is. Do you listen to everything she says? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> she's been freaking out about this all week. And so on the way here, she started playing a book on her phone on her Kindle. It was found. And um, I haven't, I didn't know any background besides what my mom had told me. And what I really liked was like, um, I'm a 15 year old sophomore in high school. And from what I remember, Mickey, he's a sophomore in high school too. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about um, when he went to basketball practice and how he was like the odd one out. I really, had a connection with him, so I really like that. Um, oh. Sorry, this is really long. No, um, no. <laughs> um, uh, in my free time at school, when I get done with my geometry homework in class, I pull out my notebook and I like to write. And um, everyone looks at me funny, but I just, I have this other notebook that's all torn up and I cover up what I'd already written so nobody can look over my shoulder and read it. Um, but I've thought about like being an English teacher or being a writer, but I just, I don't know about it yet. And, but I just wanted to know like what moment did you know you wanted to be a writer? That's a good question. That was a great question, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I was a lot older than you. I mean, um, Again, sometimes I, I was already, I've already criticized other authors for things they've said, but the other one I'm going to give you is the writer who says, I always knew I'd be a writer. Mm -hmm. When I was a three-month-old fetus, I was <laughs> scratching out sonatas in my mother's womb. I, I, wanted, I, I was over 20. Uh, I, I, when I was a senior in, uh, in college, I decided I wanted to write a book about an experience I had. And I started to write, and I kind of got like a virus. I didn't write, it, it, the book I wrote was horrible. <laughs> But I got this writing bug from that that made me want to keep writing. And what I would suggest for you is to keep writing. Don't write over it, though, because we want to know what you thought. You're going to want, you're going to, want to look at the years from now and hate it. That's part of it, OK? <laughs> you're going to look at these things in these notebooks years from now and hate them. But it's like building a step to something much higher up. You still need those bottom steps. You really do. So like, even I look back at my old books, and I can't read my old books because I cringe. And if I ask the people in the room, right? All of you had that paper in college, or a few years ago, in high school, depending on how, that you thought was brilliant, right? You find it now and you go, what was I thinking, right? <laughs> That's what you can do with your thing, but just keep writing. I'm telling you, just, even if it's a dumb thought, there's no judgment in your notebook, this is the beauty of writing. 
The beauty of writing is there's no judgment. You can, it, it might just end up being therapy. It might be something you want to show the whole world one day, but just write it down. And that's why I always say if you can give a, a person also the gift of loving to read, if a person loves to read, they're never lonely. They'll never be bored in their life. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Thank you very much for yeah, your question. That was great. Well, you guys finally got your there nerve go. up here when we're about the time we're running down, but uh, thank you. So we'll, we'll, we'll get these five, and uh, please go first. Well, now that you have established your name, I'm wondering, first of all, when you were a starting writer, what kind of feedback did you show your wife or you showed a fellow writer? And now do you find, and I assume that the editors helped edit and all that other sort of stuff, do you find that they're uh, just kind of relying more on you, that you have less help and you're taking on, or, or, or you find it harder to get good feedback, or all these writers that you do know, do you guys read each other's stuff, and, or, oh, here's a page I can't work through, do you mind just reading this one page? Well, let's start the last one. I mean, I have actually dinner once a month with a group of mystery writers. We never even talk about writing. Um, writers, you know, we never talk about it. I've never shown them a page. I've never asked them for help. They've never, it's just, it's not, it's not done. There's two answers. One is, in the early days, my wife did read it. And her job basically was to just tell me it was brilliant no matter how bad it was. <laughs> oh, yeah, honey, you've never, she's still, oh, yeah, honey, you've never been better. Really, really? Yeah, it's great. It's, you know, it's great. <laughs> just, because I was paralyzed. I'd be paralyzed. By, I, she would like to write, you know what, you have a typo here. You wrote the word the twice. Oh, it stinks, doesn't it? The whole thing, I'll just throw it out right now. So in those days, that's, what, that's sort of what I needed. The other thing is, while it's great to have feedback, most writers do have, a, if you don't have a sense of if it's good or bad, you're probably in a lot of trouble too. I'm usually the, my, my toughest editor. No one hates the book as much as I do when we're first editing it. So um, I, I'm, I'm able to critically read, but really mostly when I want someone to reread, it's like when somebody asks me if I will read their manuscripts, which by the way, I never do. It could be my brother, I never do. They really don't want re criticism. They want to hear how brilliant it is and I'm going to get them an agent and they're going to be a, you know, a best-selling author. It's the same thing with me. When I'm writing it, I don't want to hear anything critical. I'll, I'll figure out something's wrong with it later. So I don't really show it. Uh, my editor's supposed to see it at the 100 page mark by my contract. And he knows also, just tell me it's brilliant so I keep going. <laughs> if you have a problem with it, tell me about it later on. That's my own, that's my own way of working. Yes, ma'am. Uh-oh, cold feet. No, uh, she actually oh, she got oh, your okay. question. OK. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, so I, I have a question about kind of the writing process. You, mm -hmm. you know, you say you give yourself permission to suck for a little while. Right. Um, so I guess when I, my question is, when you're writing, how much attention do you pay to things like tense, head hopping, you know, uh, you know, like adverbs? I know that you know talked about Elmore Leonard, and he says no right. adverbs no ever. Adverbs. Right. Um, like how much attention do you pay to that while you're actually writing? Not much. Uh, I'm telling the story. The first time I'm writing, I'm telling the story. I also, a lot of times, will do my first drafts on paper, um, like 10 pages at a time on paper, and then put it on a computer. The reason I, I don't always do this, so I'll do whatever's going to work, but the reason I like doing that and I recommend it is that, if, first of all, there's something freeing and childlike about hand and paper. Crossing out is easier than deleting, because when you cross out, you can still, it still sort of exists versus deleting on a computer. I draw arrows, I, I can do pictures, and I don't count them as done pages till they're on the computer. So this way, my first draft is actually my second draft already. So that's mm. one of the, the, the different techniques I do. What was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. I, I was just wondering, like, you know, you talk about things like oh, I, you know, I, tense, I, I, head hopping, that kind of stuff. Like I just tell the story. Things. Like the first time, it's, it's as though you and I are sitting around a campfire, and I'm telling you a gripping story. Okay. I don't worry about anything else the first time. I'll go back on. I've written things so fast, I forget, you know, I forget periods. You know, I just keep... <laughs> writing it, and then I'll go back. Remember, you can always go back. It's so important to remember this. So I just want to get it down. I just want to get out all the stuff that I can, all that good stuff. And sometimes, literally, my fingers can't keep up with my brain. I'm going so fast. But that's the way I try to do the first draft. Those are the best first drafts. So I can get it out. Just sort of, a, as one writer once said, vomit it out. Uh, I'm not quite that way, but get it out as fast as I can, and then go back. That, remember, you can always go back. Thank you. Thank you. Have there been times in the past where you felt creatively, creatively um, drained or your imagination isn't just up to par? And if so, how do you go back to where you were before? I feel it almost every week. I mean, literally, <laughs> that's just part of my life. As I said before, I mean, that insecurity thing, it never goes away. And when it, 
I finish a book, I have no ideas left. There's a little, when I finish a book, the voice in my brain goes, that's it, you're done. <laughs> Thank you for playing, you're a writer. We'll take home the home version of the game. You're gonna get a job now someplace else and have to really work. And that just is part of the process. And one of the things I like to do sometimes is I'll even go to like art museums or just do things to fill up my brain again. Just do things and stimulate. And my, this is how my brain works. My brain kind of never shuts off. So I'm always looking at everything how can I make this into something else? How can I make this into a story? How can I look at this person and turn them into, what is their life really like? I'll make up, as I'm looking at your faces, I will actually make up whole backstories for you. Things that happened to you in your child, you know, that's just how, and I like my mind working that way. If, so I'm like not, you know, the Daniels have had dinner with me and they'll probably notice sometimes I'm rude. I get distracted, I look away. My, they, you know, they're friends so they know uh, Harlan's in La La Land. Or so, but I, my, my friends kind of know this about me. Thank you. Yes, sir. I really like the idea that you say, like, take that first draft as the big ugly rock and then shine it until it becomes beautiful. But when do you know it is shiny enough? How do you balance between being a perfectionist and having something that is good enough? Well, when you start rewriting and you're just ch you're, you're changing things that aren't making it better or worse, but changing it. Do you know what I mean? Like you start adding, the, oh, I need a the instead of a that or you're reading it and you're realizing it's not getting any better, it's just getting different. That's usually the sign. It's a little bit like raising a child though, like, and, and you reach, your child reaches a certain age and they gotta go to kindergarten and you gotta let them go out in the world and they're gonna get knocked around. They're not ready yet. You're like, as a mother, you're like, no, 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 stay home one more year with mommy. <laughs> you know, no, 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 you have to let the kid out in the world, it's gonna get knocked around them. And it might not be ready, so what? Someone's gonna reject it, you'll take it back, you'll rewrite it. When you send that also, it doesn't freeze the world either. Right, so you send it out. If, I always tell people who are waiting from publishers, write something else, either, either keep working on that book and fixing it and making better, or better start writing the next one. Because chances are this one, if it's your first book, is not really that good. Very few first books really are good. I know we all think they are. We're very, you know, but, because they're your darlings. But uh, that, that's sort of what I would, uh, uh, that's the way I do it. I don't, I don't know, there's not a set answer. Maybe the draft before would have been just as good, and maybe the draft after would have been somewhat better. I don't know, it's a feel thing. So how, how do you come the fear of like that affecting your reputation? You have something that is not as good yet, and you put it out, and then it might just be the worst novel you ever like, My wrote. reputation's not that important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this stage of the game, it is, it's, you have to be, it's funny, I mentioned insecure, but you also have to be arrogant as hell to do this, right? I'm writing 400 pages, 500 pages. I'm expecting you to spend 20 bucks on it and spend eight hours with me. Wow, what arrogance. Also, what a ridiculous honor that some of you have decided to do that. I mean, I don't take that for granted for a second. I work really, really hard on that. But like, you know, I sometimes sit and think that these, you know, you've chosen me of those 100,000 books in a library. You've chosen to spend your money and spend that time with me. Man, I better deliver. Or I'm gonna, you know, that's, it's really the most flattering thing someone can do, but I don't know. I mean, the answer is, I, you know, you have to take a risk. You know, people are like, oh, I'm afraid if I, ha if I do this, someone will steal my idea. Well, life's risk, man. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a fun risk to take, and all of us get hit. You know, we've all learned from our, you know, how you've learned from your failures in life as, as well as just more your successes, right? That's the only thing you learn from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why you're here, right? I yeah. mean, this is... You're allowed to make mistakes while you're here, so don't worry about your reputation. You don't have that great a reputation either, sir. Trust me. Neither one of us, <laughs> neither one of us have reputa good reputations as it is. So we got two more. Uh, this one first. So I'd like to start off by saying I'm not a writing major, so cool. sorry if anybody else had some I wasn't questions. a writing major either. I was a political science major, which uh, is a euphemism for I have no idea what I want to do with my life. <laughs> No idea. I'm dating a writing major, so hopefully that makes sense. That's, that's even better. I, did, so I, was, I, I married a doctor because my, my, my mother wanted me to go to medical school. It was much easier. I just married one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been writing short stories since very early on, and in the very beginning, what really brought me into a passion of writing and reading is one particular character. And I'm actually considering getting into seriously writing a book about this character, but I'm worried that that character being so close to me might, I might look back and say, wow, I wish I would have waited and actually did this when I was a better writer. What would you, what are your thoughts on that? Don't save, 
you, you, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna get smarter and stronger and better as you, people, you know, don't save up an idea, write the best thing you can now, don't worry about that kind of thing. You know, you're not gonna go in 10 years from now saying, oh, I wish I'd written that book I wrote 10 years. Write it now, because when you, when you would want, if you'd want to write it again and differently, you'll just change a few things around anyway. And if it wasn't a huge success, no one's gonna know about it, you can take it and steal. You can always steal from yourself. You can always steal. So don't hold back. I mean, I would write the best, whatever you want to write now, don't think, oh, I better save it or wait till I'm a better writer. Write it now. If you have the greatest idea in the world now and you think, I have the greatest idea, but I want to save it till I'm a better writer, that's nonsense. Write that idea now. Get it out now, because it's probably not the greatest idea, first of all. But second of all, it's like, you know, it's like you're playing a, a basketball game, right? And you're saying, oh, I'll save, this, I'll save my energy for next game. There is their next game. This is the NCAAs. This is, you know, Kentucky should have didn't say this, oh, we'll save it for next game. That's it. You lose that game, it's over. So just write like that. Write with that kind of fear and that kind of daring, because that's how you're going to get better. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Look at me handing out advice. I think I know what I'm talking about. Um, good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, to begin with, I'm an engineer, so I'm probably the least likely person to be in this room <laughs> to begin with. Um, I'm happy you're here. Like, as you said earlier uh, about making uh, backstories about people, I sometimes just happen to uh, not just stop at backstories, but I kind of make up stories with, say, my friends and as the main characters. And I start writing, like, just because I like to, I start writing about it somewhere. What happens is, after a point, I lose my concentration. And I get nitpicky about small stuff like grammar, full, uh, periods, commas. And when I get that, I'm, uh, I kind of feel conscious about what I'm writing. I get someone to kind of read it for me. And then I get the negative feedbacks after which I basically fall down. I'm like, OK, I'm giving this up. So uh, what would you suggest if you were in my position? Don't let anybody else read it. <laughs> <laughs> if you got confidence in yourself, my friend, just keep writing it. One day it'll be good enough. You go out there and you'll, look, as I said, we all have gotten rejected. That's just part of it. It's, it's a little bit, this is the other thing. You're, you're young, you're just starting out, OK? If I was to say to you, you've never played basketball before, come play basketball with me right now. And you're like, wow, I missed a bunch of shots. Yeah. Yeah, it takes some time. It's like any other skill. Writing takes some natural talent and a lot of work and a lot of time. People expect for some reason, because we all write, that we can write. Ah, oh, you gotta write. So you, what we'd do is, uh, if I was playing basketball, geez, I would go out, right, and I would practice alone with nobody watching how bad of a shot I am, mm -hmm. and eventually my shot gets a little better. You're right now practicing your shot, dude. It might be better than you know, but that's what you're doing. Do it alone, don't worry about what people say. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Well, this audience just got an awful lot of advice for free. I think you owe them a little round of applause. For <laughs> so, uh, so we always like to have a, a memento of some kind for our guests. And of course, tonight, no exception. I, I now see we blew it. Uh, I should have gone, gone and got some gold and black shoelaces. For, <laughs> But I didn't know. But uh, uh, Kathy, please, show me your who's your best. That's good. Oh, 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 oh. You needed a little. Oh. They didn't teach you that. the bounce pass in junior high, huh? <laughs> so now, uh, so Harlan, I, I, this is a little something special. It's signed uh, by our coach, Matt Painter. But oh, the, more awesome. to the point, it's signed by somebody we're really proud of here at Purdue. Uh, Brian Cardinal was a great player here. And later on, and I'll tell you why I thought of this. Brian holds an NBA record that will probably never be matched. Um, he uh, uh, has, holds the record for the most money paid per minute played. <laughs> the smart Purdue guy. $6,072.97 Six, $6, to be precise. Wow. He may be the only guy I'll ever meet who got paid more money for less, putting in less time than you did. So there, I thought you should have it. Wow, thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.